to back chat now captain logan's not here so we're not going to be doing a commentary for any of the animated series episodes or commentaries for any of the other things in in the whole batman media franchise uh instead since he's on break i decided i wanted to keep this show running and we're going to use the title of bat chat pretty loosely instead of just talking about what we set out to talk about which is the animated series I'm going to decide to talk about something in Batman in general, and so I will have a chat with my camera about it, and then you can chat about it in the comments, and then I can chat with you in the comments, and it'll be a chat about Batman. It'll be great. So today we're talking about kind of something, a little bit something specific, something that I don't think was a problem before the 90s, really. Um, maybe more so from the 2000s, but I think the 90s is where it really became an issue. Uh, mostly after uh, Batman 18, 1989. Uh, we're going to be talking about the I'm Batman problem. Now, this is something that got sparked in my mind when I was on uh, I was on a phone call with Eric, and we were talking about a story called The Doom That Came to Gotham, which is basically um, a Hellboy-esque Batman story. It's really just Batman meets Lovecraft. And for, like, the first two issues, it's really, really Lovecraftian. and people dying all over the place, and uh, an evil force no one can see with a very, very generic name. Um, it, was, it was very well done for the, for the most part, and then you get to the end, and spoilers if you haven't read it, uh, but you get to the end, and Batman's able to stop uh, the monster, the thing that's coming is how the book puts it, um, with magic arrows. And... Well, the book is fine. It's enjoyable for the most part. The issue we had, though, is in a Lovecraft story, that doesn't happen. In a Lovecraft story, someone doesn't beat the monster or the deus ex machina. In a Lovecraft story, the person in the story either dies or is so, so very lucky to survive and wishes they were dead. Uh, and just because it's Batman, he had to have a way out. Um, and now with Batman vs. Superman coming out, there, there's a whole bunch of argument as to how Batman can take everyone down, and um, ever since about 1989, ever since you got that moment with Michael Keaton holding up a thug and says, I'm Batman, um, and in the comics where Batman's able to recover from a back break, and um, well, a little bit after the back break, after he gets his 89-inspired costume, uh, it starts to become this thing where... Batman goes from the opposite extreme of being an urban legend to being super, super exaggerated, um, which I think is kind of interesting. We, we start off Batman's history with the idea that not everyone believes he's, he exists, that he's just kind of a thing in the shadows, no one really knows how to put a pulse on him, and then you get to the 90s forward and it becomes this thing where everyone knows Batman's around and they over-exaggerate everything he can do. To the point where even the writers get caught up in it and Batman can actually do all the exaggerations that people thought he could do. It gets kind of crazy in that way. And so you're able to solve any issue in a Batman story after the 90s with a simple excuse of, I'm Batman. Um, when Dark Knight Rises came out and people were poking holes in the story of how Bruce was able to do certain things, um, people, fans of the movie resorted to the excuse of, well, he's Batman. Uh, and when you think about Batman versus Superman in a fight, and you look at the Batman field, about 50% of those guys, I mean, I'm, I'm always on the Batman side, I love Batman, he's my favorite comic book character, he's my favorite character, period. But you look at the Batman side of that debate, and you look at Batman versus Superman, and, and, Superman, and for Superman they'll say, well, he's got this power and that power and this power and that power, and the Batman guys, for the most part, will say, yeah, but he's Batman. And we just kind of stopped the conversation there, you know? And I don't understand where this came from, really. I mean, I guess I kind of do. I just don't understand how it stuck for as long as it did. Um, in the first episode of The Batman for that series, um, there's a scene with Rupert Thorne where he jumps out of a window and starts running away, and Batman, out of nowhere, is able to catch him, throw him on another rooftop, and Thorne's like, how'd you do that? And Batman's like, I'm the Batman. And that, that's the only explanation you get. And you're supposed to open it and say, oh, look at how badass Batman is. Look how cool he is. Just jumping all over the place and, 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 and catching people. But in my head, I'm just wondering, no. No, how did you do that? Um, there, the animated series had quite a bit of this, too, when you get later down the line of that show, where Batman's able to stop things because he's Batman. 
And I think we kind of lost the sight of the inspiration for that character. Um, Batman's not Zorro. Batman's not the Shadow. Batman's more so Sherlock Holmes, if, and, if nothing else. Um, no, he's not exactly, but for the most part, he's more Sherlock Holmes. Now, obviously, he's a ripoff of the Shadow. Um, no bones about it. That's what he is. What can you do? Um, and he's inspired heavily by Zorro. And Zorro does have that mythic quality to him. I could buy reading stories where people would ex exaggerate what he's able to do by saying, well, he's Zorro. But the difference is Zorro is one of those characters that has a whole mythology, um, a whole mythology about that, that comes from society, a, a whole... Everything with Zorro comes from, like, a cultural zeitgeist, you know? Like, everyone is ev everyone knows everybody and everyone knows Zorro kind of thing, you know? Zorro's got a community that rallies around him in a different way from Batman. Batman's got Gotham City and his Bat family, sure, but there's a very different psychological connection between those characters where they're just kind of there by necessity and sometimes shouldn't be there at all, um, to as, whereas Zorro is sort of a staple for a certain, for a certain sect of life. And so you can believe the exaggeration a little bit more in that area. With the Shadow, he's a little bit more mystical. He's a little bit more, well, in the shadows. Uh, he's always had more of an urban legend thing going anyway, and so you could buy him doing a lot of the crazy things he's able to do because he's the Shadow. Um, Batman, you shouldn't be able to do that. Batman's a detective. Batman's a man. The whole point of Batman as a character is to be the opposite of Superman, is to be, look at this character that we created that has godly powers, now look at this other character we created that has humanly powers. Um, a guy that can do extraordinary things that are physically possible. Um, a guy that's extremely smart because he read books and because he went to school, you know? Like, Batman is our exaggerations of our abilities, not an exaggeration of abilities greater than us. And so, Batman has kind of gotten to this point where he does have a superpower. His superpower is that he's Batman. And I don't I don't like that. I think that defeats the purpose of the character. Part of what makes Batman an, uh, an inspirational character is that he is just a human being. That he's a person that, despite having means at his disposal like money, is able to conquer psychological issues, is able to conquer physical issues, is able to conquer um, pretty much anything... In a, in a way that's intrinsically human, that Batman's a character that's able to do things that we're able to do, and they should be reasonable, right? Like, most of... Uh, this is why I don't have a problem with gadget-heavy Batman. Um, part of why I enjoy gadget-heavy Batman is the gadget gives us the suspension of disbelief and gives us a superman -y cop out of, well, he's able to do this because he had a toy that does it for him. And the moment you start exaggerating Batman's physical abilities to where he can just, like do anything, take out anyone just because he's Batman and make stuff up and, and like, run away into the shadows in, in, in completely impossible ways, you start giving him a superpower of just him. And that also gets away from the reputation side of it. That also gets away from the idea that Batman's an urban legend and so people are terrified of what they don't understand. Well, this is the opposite, where people think they understand, and in essence, they do. If, ba if someone in a Gotham City story says something like, I don't want to do this because I'm sure Batman's going to stop us, he's going to stop you. Um, there, there's no challenge, at least not for the reader anyway. Um, you don't get inside Batman's head in, a, in the same way you used to. There used to be a point, especially around Nightfall, so I guess maybe this didn't start in the 90s, maybe it was a little bit later, uh, but there's, there's points in Nightfall where Batman talks about how physically difficult some of the things he's doing are. Um, part of why I like older comic writing for Batman, particularly 70s comics and then uh, 30s and 40s comics, uh, is because they, those older comics describe the action, right? Like, you see what's going on in the panel, and then the comic is still describing it to you, which is not great all the time. Sometimes it's irritating. Um, a lot of times it's irritating. Kurt Busiek does it all the time. I can't stand it when he does that. Uh, but I like it with Batman because you're seeing feats that are incredible. And then in his mind, he's telling you how he's doing them. And that makes it work more. That makes the human connection stronger. And the moment you get Batman away from his humanity, he stops being the same type of character. When you're able to just pull out the excuse of, I'm Batman for anything, it stops being fun. It stops being interesting. It stops being, it stops being an intellectual skill, I guess, is the best way to put it. Um, 
I say he's more like Sherlock Holmes than anything else, kind of, because Sherlock Holmes is wrong. There are lots of stories where Sherlock Holmes doesn't have any idea what's going on. There are multiple occasions, multiple stories where uh, Sherlock opens with, well, let me tell you about a case I didn't solve, or let me tell you about something that stumped me. Um, there are great moments in Sherlock Holmes stories where he really doesn't know. And things don't become clear until the very end when even you could put them together. And that was the beauty of a lot of Sherlock Holmes stories is that you could put them together. It, 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 became, a, it became an intellectual exercise because you could follow along with the observations. Sir Arthur Corn Doyle was a master of that. He was a master of, of giving you the right sorts of descriptions. Um, he knew that everything was relevant. So if he's telling you about what a color, what the color of someone's shoes are, or how dirty their hands are, that's not to make you feel like you're more really there. It's to tell you that this is a clue. Think about why these shoe colors are the way they are, or why this guy's hand is dirty. That it, it became, it became so much more active. And Batman had that to a degree. Batman used to be able to do that. He used to be Sherlock Holmes. He used to be the kind of character that would set out on a mystery, potentially solve it. A lot of times it didn't go his way, which is why he ended up killing uh, criminals in the Golden Age. Um, Batman wasn't a person that was able to conquer everything. And so it became a, a double... Uh, it, it, became, it started to work in, in two ways. It started to work as, look at everything this man can do be, just because he's a human being. And look at everything he can't do because he's a human being. You know, we started exploring both avenues of that. And it's weird that this is inversely related to Superman. Because as Batman slowly stepped away from this, Superman slowly stepped into it. I mean, you look at John Byrne's Superman stuff, and that's exactly what it became, right? Like, Superman became this guy with, with extraordinary powers that we had to dumb down to a little bit, to a, a slower, to at least a little bit of a degree when he got Man of Steel, the comic. Um, and it became more about Clark Kent. It became about, look at all these things this guy can do because he's an alien. Now look at how he thinks about them and handles them and how he has to live his life because mentally he's a human being. Um, there's so many uh, there's so many moments of bumbling Clark Kent, shy Clark Kent, confident Clark Kent that tell you about the range of human experience and human triumph and human failings. And we get so much more of that. Look at Superman Earth One. Look at All Star Superman. There's so many more human moments with that character where he can't do something because he's Superman, as opposed to look at everything this guy can do because he's Batman. And I don't know, it's been bugging me for a while now. It makes it difficult to read Batman comics. Um, because now we're just kind of writing stoic, right all the time animated series Batman, and I just, I'm not enjoying it. Um, Batman the Animated Series is is great. You know, it, it's a seminal work of animation. It's every, every episode is like a movie, uh, production wise at least. Uh, a lot of the voice acting is really good, but. There are a lot of bad episodes to that show. There were a lot of bad episodes, particularly in season one, definitely in season three. Season two is probably the best of that show. Um, New Adventures is good, but it became sort of a different thing at that point. And as you look at the whole DC anime universe as a whole, there's a progress from grim, gritty Batman, Dark Knight Detective to Batman, I can do anything. Um, now, obviously, a counter... At least, if you're if you're arguing with me about this, would be well, you like Grant Morrison. He's the guy that literally turned Batman into a god, and I'd be like, yeah, fair enough. But see, that's the thing. Grant Morrison was talking about this. Grant Morrison was using the Bat God to address this. That book, that whole run, was about the fact that Batman became a corporate entity. Batman became this thing that you have to keep perpetually going and perpetually winning because it makes DC Comics money. It became about it became about trying to make Bruce Wayne into a human being again by exaggerating and discussing what DC Comics had commercially turned him into. And the ending of that run is extremely sad where Bruce says that I tried to do something. I tried to break the mold and I just couldn't because it's DC Comics, it's Warner Brothers, it's a media juggernaut. There's there's only so much he could do as a writer to get us there. And so, it, 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 yeah, he's a bad god, but it's telling you why that's a problem and, and what, it's, what it's supposed to mean. Batman as a god should be inspirational to the reader, not something that solves all of his problems in the books, because it still didn't, right? Like, Batman became a bad god by the end of um, Return of Bruce Wayne, 
But then after that, he's just Batman. He's globetrotting with lots of money, but he's just Batman. Um, and that's the thing, right? Like, that's the distinction is I'm Batman versus he's Batman. Um, the, the, the sort of tonal difference between the uh, confident I can do whatever because I'm Batman and the he can do what he can because he's Batman and he can do what he can because he's Aquaman and he can do what he can because he's Robin. You know, there has to be limits. These, these characters can't become all powerful. Um, recently, semi-recently, I think of just a few weeks ago now actually, um, Umberto Eco died, an incredible novelist, an incredible aesthetic philosopher, um, absolutely genius thinker, one of the guys I really, really wish I could have met before he died, uh, up there with Grant Morrison and Joss Whedon. Brilliant, brilliant man. Wrote a paper on the mythology of Superman. And in, in, his, in his essay, the crux of it was, look at how Superman represents the evolution of classic mythological heroes. And a lot of his work had to do with symbolism, so he, he kind of dove into what visual components of the Superman character represent visual components of mythology. But by the end of the argument, by the end of the paper, the biggest point he wanted to make is Superman has kryptonite. There has to be something that dumbs him down. There has to be a limit. And so if Superman's powers are his, are his powers and kryptonite is his weakness, Batman's power is that he's a human being and his weakness is that he's a human being. And we have really, really forgotten that last component. And Berto Echo says that the reason Superman works at all, the reason mythology works at all, the reason heroism works at all is because there is a chance of failure. And we've lost that with Batman. We've lost the ability to tell a story where Batman just loses. Um, I mean, even when, when people do defeatist stuff like uh, like Scott Snyder's Batman, even when people do stuff like, uh, well, he, he won the day, but he lost this thing, it's it's not the same, right? It, it's not... Okay, so he saved Gotham City from total annihilation, but he lost his Bat family. It's not really that big of a loss. He's bad at interpersonal relationships. He still saved the world in completely implausible ways. It's, it's, it's just the nature of that character now where he can do impossible things in order to get things back to status quo. It doesn't matter if you throw him in bad interpersonal relationships because everyone can relate to that, but they can't relate to that to the degree Batman can. They can't be like... Yeah, Batman broke up with his girlfriend. That's exactly like the time where I went out and started fighting crime in the middle of the night with lots of money and lost my girlfriend because I was trying to beat up the Joker. Totally works as a metaphor. It doesn't, right? It, it, it's ridiculous. Superman's got that, though. Superman is... I know it's weird that this is turning into a pro-Superman video because I'm the Batman guy, but... Um, Superman has that. Superman has the ability to have relationship problems with, with Lois Lane not because of his superpowers, but because of the way he was raised, right? Like, Superman was raised in Kansas. He's a farm kid. Lois is an army brat. She grew up in the city. They have got a human connection with each other that they are opposites, and sometimes those opposites make great sparks, and sometimes they cause them to fight. Lois has lots of issues with the way Clark is able to just see everyone as, as inherently good, and, uh, Lois, and, and Clark can't understand why Lois doesn't. Batman doesn't have that. Batman's relationship problems begin and end with, well, I can't be in a relationship and be Batman. I can't be a father and be Batman. I can't, um, I can't reasonably live and go to sleep at a, at a sound hour because I'm Batman. Um, I work a lot. I mean, I'm sure you people know this. I work a lot. I don't go for a night without sleeping and only eat a sandwich from my butler, right? Like that... That's not how I live, and I'm not saying Batman has to be exactly like reality. Of course not. It is a fiction. It has to be elevated to a degree, but the fiction has to stand for something. Batman is mythology. Superman is mythology. Comic books, superheroes are mythology. Mythology begins and ends with tragedy. It begins and ends with the understanding of the human experience. And regardless of how powerful Hercules was, it came down to what he couldn't do. It came down to the challenge. And the more you lose that with Batman, the less you make him interesting. Um, I don't need a story where Batman's down on his luck, doesn't have any money, is living in an apartment, and um, has relationship issues. I don't need that. I need Batman to deal with things in a way that a normal human being would deal with them, at least to a degree, right? 
I'm not saying Batman has to suddenly stop being the smartest man on the planet. I'm saying there has to start being stories where Batman is wrong. There has to start being a story where Batman can't do something because he's human. That's why Batman Venom works. That's why Nightfall works. Uh, that's why those are some of my favorite Batman stories. That's why uh, Batman Shaman works because it captures the essence of the things we can't understand and the scope of things we can't understand as human beings. Um, it becomes about limitation. You can't just have a, a perfect metaphor that Batman's able to will anything because he's a human being, because as human beings, we can't will anything. There are certain things we just can't do. That's what makes this interesting. And I guess I'm just repeating myself at that point, but that, that sort of becomes the essence of my issue, is just Batman can do anything because he's Batman. And when you do that, you set a very dangerous precedent. Um, it's very weird, but they should be taking notes for Superman. Um, I mean, I'm not reading a lot of modern stuff, but taking away Superman's powers, part of what Grant Morrison did with it, kind of making him live in the world and, and capitalizing on the things he can't do and the way he's relating to the world is a good idea. You don't have to take away Batman's means. You don't have to make him poor. You don't have to make him lose his butler. You don't have to make him lose his bad family. You don't have to make him lose his training. You just have to start making it so that I can understand how he's doing things and he's allowed to fail. And that's really all I got to say on, on that issue. Um, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Um, do you think this has become an increasing problem? Where do you think the real start of it was? Um, do you think this is something that we can solve going forward? Um, because I just don't know. I just don't know if the public consciousness is, is weak enough to this idea. I feel like everyone has just sort of accepted it and it, it's become a paradigm of Batman. And I don't know how long it's going to be before it goes away. Um, and I'd be interested to see how you guys want to write Batman with that weakness idea in mind. Um, I'll put a link in the description to that Umberto Eco essay I mentioned. He, he died recently. He's an absolutely genius thinker. Um, incredible, incredible man. Um, Foucault's Pendulum, beautiful book. Name of the Rose, beautiful book. Um, the Open Work, I used that when I, was my, when I did my Daredevil analysis. Just brilliant, brilliant stuff. Um, his essay on Superman is, is really quite good, and um, if you want to understand like the importance of that character as pathology, the importance of the kryptonite weakness to him, go ahead and, and read that. It's only about nine or ten pages. Um, so, so thanks everybody for watching, and I'll see you next time.